Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Margaret E. Sangster's The Arbutus Bonnet, starring Anne Blythe on the Hallmark Playhouse. Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we find ourselves on the threshold of Easter, one of the great seasons of the year, symbolical of springtime, of hope, and of rebirth. In these days especially, it's good to remember that tradition of ours which gives us each year a message of encouragement and inspiration. And tonight we tell a story called The Arbutus Bonnet by Margaret E. Sangster, an Easter story with an Easter message. And we're especially privileged to welcome one of Hollywood's most charming and youthful stars, an actress whose own winsomeness is in tune with the season of the year, Miss Anne Blythe. And now, a word about Hallmark Cards from Frank Goss, before we begin the first act of The Arbutus Bonnet. At Easter, as on every important event in the lives of your friends and loved ones, there is a Hallmark card to say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And the Hallmark on the back will carry an extra meaning for Easter Day, for it says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Margaret E. Sangster's The Arbutus Bonnet, starring Miss Anne Blythe. When I look back now to those days in 1903, I can see that the story of my Arbutus bonnet is the story of the springtime that every girl waits for. The spring that comes riding over the hilltops with banners flying. The spring that somehow heralds the coming of Prince Charming. Eleanor, do you know that you've been sitting by that window daydreaming for almost two hours? Eleanor. Eleanor, do you hear me? Eleanor. What? Oh, oh I'm sorry, Father. What did you say? I said that... <laughs> Never mind. It wasn't of any particular importance. As a matter of fact... All day I've been thinking of the day I met your mother. Oh. Was it spring? Yes. It was spring. Although it was snowing, and the paper said it was the coldest day of the winter. But when I looked into her eyes, it was spring. Oh, everyone's love story should be just like yours and mother's. Almost everyone's is, Eleanor. You know, I think I have a very romantic little girl. <gasps> Uh-oh. It's four o'clock. I have to deliver a basket of eggs. Oh, did I tell you I had a new customer? No. Who? A woman stopped by this morning and said she was the housekeeper in the Grant House up on the hill. And she gave me a weekly order for eggs. The Grant House? Well, the Grants haven't been in the village for at least ten years. Mr. Grant is a big financier. Well, I'd better get up there or I'll never get back by dinner time. You know, my dear, you're more like your mother every day. I wish she could see you. Don't you think she does, Father? Yes, Eleanor. I'm sure she does. And I'm sure she's more than pleased. I ran down the road that led from the parsonage to the Grand House. I ran because the sky was blue and the fields were bright with youth and color. And all of life was just around the corner. I ran as hard as I could toward the most exciting moment of my life. don't know what he said after that, or what I answered. I only know the drums of spring beat loudly in my ears, and I crossed an enchanted threshold. The days that followed were like music, heard but once, but remembered eternally. Then 
that's the church where my father preaches. And over there's the drugstore and, oh, the dry goods store. Oh, and that's the post office. I've never been in a really small town before. Oh, I've never been in a city. Someday I'll show you the city. Turnabout is only fair play, you know. Oh, it's funny. When my father told me they were going to have me come down here to recoup from that bout with pneumonia, <laughs> I had a fit. I had no idea how wonderful the town could be. Come on. I want to show you the high school. Oh, I'm stuffed. Who fried the chicken? <laughs> I did. Oh, I'm glad you thought of coming up here on top of the hill for the picnic. It's a wonderful spot. Oh, yes. I, I've always loved it. What are those flowers over there? Arbutus. My mother wore them in her hair when she was married. I always thought I'd have a cap made of them when I got married. An Arbutus bonnet. Of course, bonnets aren't very fashionable right now, but maybe by the time I get married, they will be, and then... When I get married, I... I hope I get to marry a girl wearing an Arbutus bonnet. Oh, I hope you do. The end of summer. Oh, I can't believe it. Doesn't it seem like yesterday to you that you knocked at the front door? It was spring. No, it's autumn. We'd better start walking toward the depot. It's almost nine. Don't want to miss your train. Well... Will you write to me at college? Oh, of course I will. Eleanor, I... I'm coming back. You... You believe that, don't you? Well, I... I hope you'll come back. Eleanor, do... Do you think it would be all right if I... If I kissed you goodbye? Oh, Bob. Bob. Bye, Eleanor. I, I'll have to run for the train. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> Eleanor, I wonder if you'd help me look up some notes for my sermon. Oh, Father. Why must there be endings? Why, so there can be beginnings, my child. So there can be beginnings. And so autumn came, and then winter, and then spring again. Bob wrote that he was going abroad with his family for the summer. I put my hair up that summer and taught a Sunday school class. Father was right. A great deal happened. Eleanor, there's something I want to talk to you about. Oh, James, not tonight. I'm preparing the Sunday school lesson for my class. Eleanor, I've what? spoken to your father, and... Well, I, I don't intend to be put off any longer... I, I've prepared a speech, and I'd very much appreciate it if you'd hear me out. My farm's doing well. I could make you a good living, Eleanor, and I'd James, always... James, I'm not in love with you. Well, you're surely not still thinking about that grandfather. He's been gone... Well, how long? Almost three years. Well? His parents took him to Europe. He's studying there. Well, you don't think he'll come back to a town like this, Whether or not Bob Grant returns is not the issue... The issue is whether I'm in love with you. And I'm sorry, James, but I'm not. Okay. I guess that's that. It seems to me I've heard that door slam by quite a few indignant young men lately. I don't know why it is that suddenly everyone wants to get married. Eleanor, I don't want you to be so under the spell of something that happened in the past that you let it spoil your future. Suppose he never comes back. He said he'd come back. My dear, you have amazing faith. Well, Father, I'm your daughter. Father, I'm going to walk down to the library. Oh, I'll see if your books came on the evening train. Thank you, dear. Say, 
Can you tell me where I might find a girl wearing an Arbutus bonnet? Bob. Oh, Bob, is it really you? Why didn't you write you were coming? Why didn't you tell me you were back from Europe? Oh, why... Hey, 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 easy now, one at a time. We got in from Europe yesterday. As soon as we landed, I came right down here. Oh, I've got a lot to tell you. Oh, I can't believe you're really here. Eleanor, do you know what I'm going to do? No. No, I've... I'm going to Panama to help build the Panama Canal. Your what? Oh, I knew you'd be speechless. My father is pretty close to Teddy Roosevelt. He fixed it for me. I leave next week. Oh. Why don't you say something? Why? Oh, that's wonderful, Bob. I'm sure I wish you every success. I don't know how long we're going to be there, but well, it can't be too long. And when I come back, I ought to have made some sort of name for myself as an engineer. Of course you will. And, uh... And... Well, if you didn't mind waiting until then, that is... Uh, if, if you'd be willing to be engaged until then. If I'd be willing to be engaged. I, I didn't want to go down there until I, I knew how you felt about things. And, well, if you would wait. Oh, of course I'll wait. I'll wait forever if it's necessary. Well, I, I hope it won't be necessary to wait that long. Eleanor, don't you think that, Bob? It is Bob Grant. Uh, yes, it is, Reverend. How do you do? Well, forgive me for not recognizing you at once. It's pretty dark out here, and my glasses seem to be getting older. Reverend, I want to ask you for your daughter's hand in marriage. Well, don't you think you ought to come inside and put down those bags and then ask me? Uh, yes, sir. I, I'd like to tell you my plans right away, Reverend. You see, I have to leave on the train tomorrow night. Tomorrow? Well, come in and tell me all about it. We'll have to start for the train in a few minutes. It, yes. It's funny how fast time goes, isn't it? There were so many things I wanted to tell you that I, I haven't had time to say. I feel the same way. I wanted to tell you how I was in love with you before I ever met you. And how I've been in love with you ever since. I wanted to tell you that if you hadn't come back, there wouldn't have been anyone, ever. I, I brought you a ring. I, I don't know if it'll fit. It, it was my mother's. She said, take it to Eleanor with our love and with yours. Here, let me put it on your finger. Oh, Bob. Bob, it's beautiful. She said that when my father put it on her finger, he said, here is my promise to love you and to cherish you all the days of my life. I'm putting it on your finger with the same promise. And when you look at it, you can know that wherever I am, I'm thinking of you. And counting the moments until I can get back to you. This ring is my promise of the future. He was gone a few moments later, but I had his ring on my finger and his name on my heart and an unshakable faith in the future we would have together. Turn to the second act of the Arbutus Bonnet, starring Anne Blythe. It was Joseph Conrad, foreign-born master of our native tongue and widely known author of Lord Jim, who said, Give me the right word and I will move the world. Yes, the right word can move the world, can double our joys, cement our friendships, solidify our love. And no one appreciates the importance of the right word so well as the makers of Hallmark Cards. With rare discernment, they know there is no magic like the magic of words to reach the hearts of others. So you'll always find a Hallmark card that truly expresses your own feelings, whatever the occasion. 
And every Hallmark card will speak also of your own good taste by its perfection in every detail of color and design. That's why if you ask any group of friends what name they think of in greeting cards when they want to send the very best, they quickly answer Hallmark cards. Easter is one of the important occasions when we want to remember friends and loved ones. And for every friend, all those you care for, you'll find Hallmark Easter cards that say what you want to say, the way you want to say it. Cards with flowers bright as spring. Cards that express the deep spiritual joy of Easter. Clever cards to enchant the children and cards for them to send. All have the hallmark on the back that says you cared enough to send the very best. And now back to James Hilton and the second act of The Arbutus Bonnet, starring Anne Blythe. sailed for Panama, and Eleanor waited at home, living in the manner prescribed for young ladies in those early days of the 20th century. She would remember those days of waiting as long as she lived. Life seemed suspended between letters. I kept house for my father, taught my Sunday school classes, acted as a bridesmaid now and then, and read Bob's letters over and over. Dear Eleanor, I wish you could be here to see Panama for yourself. The jungle is on all sides of us now, but I turn my eyes from the jungle to the walls of our cottage, and there I see the sketches of what is to come. Great highway of water cutting through the jungle. Dear Eleanor, I am lonely tonight and more than a little heartsick. We lost three of our best men today. Yellow fever. Dear Eleanor, you may not hear from me for a short time because tomorrow we're going inland to survey excavation conditions. I will never be able to tell you how I miss you. That was the last letter from Panama. Eleanor, may I speak to you a moment? Oh, of course, Father. I was just going down to see if the mail had come in. Sit down, Eleanor. Eleanor, I've had a telegram from Bob's parents. Bob's parents? Eleanor, Bob is... Bob is... What are you trying to tell me? Bob is dead. No. Oh. He went in and on an expedition. The expedition never returned. They sent out searching parties. They weren't even able to find a trace of them. Oh, my child, He's I... all right, Father. If something had happened to him, I'd know it. I'd know it, I'd tell you. I'd know it. He's alive. I'm sure he's alive. <laughs> slowly, deep agonies brought on by small wounds, an empty letterbox, an empty depot, an empty road. Hope, hope dies slowly under the burning pain of unshed tears as time passes, and the endless empty days stretch on ahead endlessly. But at last it dies, and all hope ends. Eleanor, it's three in the morning. You must get some sleep. I can't sleep. What's happened to you? What's wrong? He isn't coming back. You know that, don't you? You've always known it. He's never coming back. He's dead. No one even knows where he is. He's dead. dead. What's happened to your faith, Ellen? Faith? What do you expect me to have faith in? God? There is no God. There is no God. Or things like this wouldn't happen. Eleanor. Faith is for children. No. No. We try to teach our children faith so that they will have a staff upon which to lean when sorrow and travail comes. We aren't put on this earth solely for our own happiness. We're put here to serve God's purpose. And it's not for us to question that purpose. I'm sorry, Father. But those are only words to me now. 
And words won't fill a heart or fill a life or give it meaning. He's dead and there's nothing left in the world. There's nothing left in the world. <laughs> I'm leaving for the church now, Eleanor. All right, Father. I'll have lunch ready for you when you return. Won't you even come to the Easter services? I'm sure if you No, would... Father. I have a great deal to do. I thought I might straighten things up in the attic. They're in an awful mess up there. On Easter Sunday? Why not? It's just like any other day when you come right down to it. Very well, Eleanor. Whatever you say. What a mess. Well, I might as well start in on this box as any. What's this letter doing in with these old blouses? Reverend John Cartley, chaplain. It looks like Mother's handwriting. My dearest John. It is Mother's handwriting. My dearest John. The hour is late and I'm alone. I feel almost as though a miracle happened to me today and I wanted to write you. These are troubled times. You are far from me, a chaplain on the battlefield in another part of the world. Often of late, I have wakened in the night cold with terror, thinking I heard the sound of battle, wondering if I heard them because they were close to you. And then fear would pull me down down into such an abyss of loneliness and despair that I began to think that something had happened and you were lost to me. But today we were getting ready for the Easter services at the church and I was looking for the proper lesson for my Sunday school class when I found some ancient and beloved words that healed my spirit and brought me peace. These words, which you know so well. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Sometimes, my darling, in these black and troubled hours, we need to hear those words again to reassure and sustain ourselves. I feel as though my own spirit has been resurrected because for a while faith deserted me and I walked as one dead among the living. I called on Dr. Alexander on my way home and he told me I was going to have a child. And then I knew more clearly than ever how hope follows hopelessness and resurrection follows despair. You must destroy this letter after you have read it, for it would never do for anyone to think of a minister's wife losing her faith, even momentarily. I do not know what God has planned for us, but I am content now to leave it in his hands and know that whatever comes from the hand of God must be good. Mother. Oh, Mother. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I ran from the house, grabbing a hat as I left. I ran as fast as I could to the top of the hill, and I gathered the arbutus to make an arbutus bonnet. I pinned them to the hat as I ran back down the hill toward the church bells, toward my father, toward my faith in life and love and God. My father was just finishing his sermon as I entered the church. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? I was looking for a she girl in an arbutus bonnet. Yea, Lord. Bob, I believe somehow that thou I was sure this was where I would find her on Easter Sunday. <gasps> Which should come oh, Bob. I just got off the train, dear. Who I came straight to the church. Then believeth in me shall never die. Oh, 
Oh, darling. Darling, I waited so long without word from you. We came down with yellow fever. Some natives found us and took us to their village. I was completely out of commission for months. I was afraid you were never coming back. I told you I'd be back. Eleanor, what brought you to the church? Did you know Bob would be here? No. No, I found a letter that Mother had written you. A letter? Your mother had written me? Yes. It was a letter she wrote you while you were away. She told you she had almost lost faith and hope. That was the letter she wrote telling me that you were coming. Yes. She asked me to destroy the letter. Yes, I saw that. Eleanor, I did destroy that letter. You did destroy it. Just as she asked me to. I never brought it back from the battlefield. You you destroyed it. She wrote, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And so at last... Once more, it was the spring that somehow heralds the coming of Prince Charming. And the story of my Arbutus bonnet ended, as we had dreamed it would, in the old village church with my father saying the beloved ancient words. And there is nothing more to tell, for just as we dreamed we would, we lived happily ever after. Next Sunday is Easter. I hope you've already made your selections of Hallmark Easter cards. But if not, there's still time to find a card that will be just right for everyone you want to remember. There are cards for those dear to you that convey thoughts often felt but too seldom expressed. There are cards that will bring a warm glow to all your friends, near or far. I recall that one of the most pleasant experiences we had last year was receiving an Easter card from a couple we hadn't seen in years and whose address we had lost. Their card brought back many fond memories. It made me appreciate more than ever what a perfect occasion Easter is for remembering others. So if you haven't already shopped for your Easter cards, I hope you'll make a list now and select them tomorrow at the fine store where you buy your Hallmark cards. And as always, you'll want to look for the Hallmark on the back of each card to say you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you, Anne Blythe, for a very moving performance. We were delighted to have you with us again on the Hallmark Playhouse. And I was delighted to be here, Mr. Hilton. But it's always a pleasure to appear on Hallmark Playhouse. Your stories are always about such wonderful people. You sound like one of our admirers. (laughs) I certainly am. And I'm enthusiastic about Hallmark cards, too. And you know, I've already thought of several more people I want to buy Hallmark Easter cards for tomorrow... And now, Mr. Hilton, I understand that next week you will have one of your own stories on the Hallmark Playhouse. Yes, it's called A Passionata. And I must admit, I'm a little bit partial to it because it's based on a theme of music. But it's also a romantic story. Oh, really? Who then is your star? Charles Boyer. And we're very happy indeed about it. Oh, I certainly won't miss it. Good. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our script tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Anne Blythe appeared to the courtesy of Universal International Pictures, who will soon release Ma and Pa Kettle Go to Town, starring Marjorie Maine and Percy Kilbride. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present James Hilton's Appassionata, starring Charles Boyer. And the week following, Rosalind Russell and my sister Eileen. And the week after that, Alice McKay's They Came to a River on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNBC, Kansas City, Missouri.